ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this show is basically about obsession and uh, about love, about romance and about drugs. Not necessarily in that order, but uh, it's basically about um, my experiences with uh, drugs and drugs of addiction and romance and romantic love. And I think there is a relationship there. A lot of people don't think so. I think there's a relationship between getting into taking a drug and getting into a romantic relationship in that initially it's something you might do when you're young, something very exciting, something illicit, something you may have heard a lot about but not necessarily done, something that perhaps your parents dissuade you from doing and something that if you do it for long enough will completely fuck your life. Um, so it's a lot like the relationships that I've been <laughs> And it's worth pointing out at this stage too that this is not a pro-drug show. Uh, by any means. It's more a kind of amateur drug show. <laughs> so, I think two things you should know about this. Uh, one of them is that uh, I, in, in what I laughingly refer to as my career, I was at one stage in Neighbours. Um, I actually killed Daphne on Neighbours. Yeah, well, I think if you're going to be in a show that bad, you should at least take out one of the main characters. <laughs> and, uh, and also, um, at one stage in this progression of drugs that I took, I got into taking heroin because I'm very intelligent. <laughs> um, and I did that for about 12 years. But then uh, after about 12 years, I thought I should stop taking heroin because there, are, there were other things I wanted to do with my life. Uh, there were things I needed to do, like uh, the dishes, for example. <laughs> they, they had piled up somewhat. And uh, so I did. And I actually went to a drug, uh, I went to a drug rehab place. I went to a drug rehabilitation place. And I stayed there for, you know, about a second. <laughs> well, there was no heroin there, you know. So it, was, it was insane. But um, no, I decided that uh, I would actually go home and do this. I left the drug rehab place and went through this stuff at home. And um, as you can probably imagine, or may, you may know, uh, coming down off heroin is incredibly unpleasant. Uh, as pleasant as it is to get into taking it, coming down off it is far, far more unpleasant. And uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, the whole bit. So I did that, and uh, after about three or four days of that, the worst of it is over. And I got a phone call from uh, The Truth newspaper. Now, those of you that don't know The Truth newspaper, suffice to say they have a fairly ironic title. <laughs> um, and they rang me up and said, look, uh, we understand you've been in a drug rehabilitation place. And, uh, and I said, yes. I thought, I've been lying for 12 years. I might as well tell the truth once. And uh, I said, yes, I have. And they said, well, because you've been in Neighbours, we thought that'd be a really good story. How do you feel about talking to us about it? And I said, how do you feel about... Um, smashing yourself in the testicles with a really big hammer. And uh, he said, not very good. And, uh, and I said, ipso facto, same reaction from me. Uh, and then there was all this drama because he didn't know what ipso facto meant. So it was <laughs> weird. This weird Latin thing going on there for a while. And uh, look, he said to me, look, the thing is, he said it's going to be a really small article. It'll be on page six. You know, it won't spin you out. He said it'll, be, it'll help other people. And he said, basically, if you don't talk to us about it, we'll have to make it up. <laughs> and uh, I thought, yes, they would, because that's the sort of people they are. So I thought, all right. A couple of days later, I'm walking down the street, and I walk past a newsagent. And you know those cages they have out in front of newsagents <laughs> with the headlines in them, right? I see something, and I kind of go, I know that guy. <laughs> That's me. Right? There's a big picture of my head and this huge headline saying, Neighbours Star Tells My Heroin Ordeal. <laughs> and I just thought, my life is over. Like, certainly professionally, my life is over. And I'm standing there, spinning out. This old woman walked past, stopped, looked at me, looked at the thing, looked back at me and said, you need God in your life. <laughs> But it did make me think about how this whole thing occurred and how I ended up in the position that I was in, standing at the front of a news agent looking at the end of my, my life. And, uh, and it, it got me back to where this all started for me. And where it started for me was with cigarettes and alcohol at school. The first time I got into smoking cigarettes, the person who taught me how to smoke was also the person who taught me how to kiss properly. So uh, automatically for me, that thing of uh, romantic uh, love and substance abuse was linked, right? Because the person who taught me how to, how to smoke taught me how to kiss. And we'd have these, like, really long, nervous kisses, you know, that eventually were just really long. And uh, then we'd have the equivalent, sort of 12-year-old equivalent of a post-coital cigarette, you know, going... Mm. How was it for you? <laughs> oh, kind of weird and slaggy. How about you? Yeah, same. But, um, but it was, you know, romantic in its own way. 
And, uh, and I remember drinking at school too, drinking. I remember we went on a school canoe trip once and um, it, was, uh, it was my friend Michael's birthday. And because it was his birthday, we decided to take all his clothes off and chase him around, you know, <laughs> as you do. And uh, so he's in his underpants and he's like charging, like running like only a kid can with that energy, just flying through the bush. And we're in a pack following him, right? Sort of like Lord of the Flies. Like, you know, you know, and, uh, and he didn't see this because it was late at night. Three strands of barbed wire, right? And he runs into it and he caught it on the upstep, right? He caught it on the way up and just went ka into his chest and was holding him off the ground, right? Hanging by his skin. Now, he'd also dropped one of those little bottles of scotch, right? Because he dropped that, he was trying to pick it up and he was like bouncing, <laughs> like digging it in further, trying to reach the scotch. And you'll be pleased to know he did reach it in the end. But, <laughs> but unbelievable, like digging this into his skin, hanging off his skin, pissing himself laughing. Now, he woke up the next morning not laughing quite so much. And the first thing I ever learned about drugs in that, on that level was if you're going to get really, really pissed and do dangerous things, stay pissed for the rest of your life. <laughs> because if you stay pissed, you never ever feel pain, you never get old and you never die. <laughs> anyway, but you know those moments that you have in your life? You know those moments that you have in your life that are just perfect, right? Like just perfect, perfect moments. And like, you might, uh, you might have 10 or 12 of these in your life. And that, that to me is a good life, if you can have that many. And they might go for a couple of seconds, they might go for a few minutes, and they're just perfect. And I remember the first one I ever had of these. I was 12 years old, I was at school, I was inside a hedge smoking a cigarette, right? So I'm in this hedge, it's like six o'clock in the morning, really crisp morning, really kind of misty, and I'm smoking the cig, and I suddenly just went, this is heaven. <laughs> Life will rarely get better than it is right now. <laughs> And it rarely has, right? I mean, I've had, you know, I've done more exciting things and I've had dynamic experiences, but the essence of that feeling has never really been beaten. The essence of that kind of thrilling, perfect feeling has never got better. And it's, it's that essence that I guess I went looking for in most of the drugs and stuff that I took and most of the relationships that I was in. It's something that I, I guess I look for all the time. And... I mean, the next step, I guess, in this process would have been from cigarettes and alcohol would have been marijuana and uh, from marijuana into LSD, magic mushrooms, ecstasy, the hallucinogen family, as that group of drugs are known. And I often wonder, is there a real family called that somewhere? <laughs> you know, the hallucinogen family. Right? <laughs> saying, come in, come in, come in, meet my wife, Pointy Beetle. Yeah. There's my son, Melted Chair. Come in, come in. We're eating noise. <laughs> so the first time I had marijuana, nothing very remarkable happened. It was not that thrilling an experience. But uh, I smoked a bit of marijuana through school, uh, a little bit, you know, after school, um, a little bit more the next morning before school. <laughs> No, a little bit after school. In my late teens, early 20s, started smoking a bit more. For some reason, in my mid-20s, there was a group of about seven of us who just went marijuana crazy, right? And you will probably know a lot of these people. I won't be using names, but you would know them from shows and stuff like that. And there's something about young men and bongs, or marijuana water pipes, bongs, that is just like... Yes! Yes! It was ludicrous. You know, it got to the stage where you'd knock on someone's door and they'd open the door and they'd go, Are you a friend of the bong? <laughs> Truly, sir, I am. <laughs> then enter here and smoke upon mine, kind stranger. So, like, it got very gothic, you know. We used to have the bong Olympics, right? And this is going to be a demonstration sport in the 2000 Olympics, I think. The bong Olympics was basically, you would get up, you would pull a bong, you would pull it as fast as you could, right? There'd be someone standing next to you with a stopwatch timing you. There would be a third person sitting at a desk with the book of records. And if a record got broken, which they did quite often, they would enter into this, the date, the time, the kind of pot involved, the weather conditions, all that sort of stuff. And they also had to wear one of those weird peaky things on their head. Right? So you do that, and not unlike the real Olympics, we got better. You know, like, you look at the Olympic Games from, like, 1896 till now, and the records generally go every four years, every eight years, whatever. We were the same. Like, the original record for the large cone was 3.2 seconds. We got that down to 0.8 of a second. <laughs> because we applied the technology, right? 
I mean, you know, people would get up to pull a bomb, they'd say, okay, I want the bathroom door open, I want the kitchen window open, I want a wind tunnel running through this house. People would be pulling bombs into the wind, like this, you know? Like, I mean, we wore lycra, for God's sake. <laughs> but the other thing is, you cannot pull bongs forever. You just can't. Like, pulling bongs, it's, you know, it's, it's some kind of, I don't know, it's a medical thing. I'm not sure exactly what the thing is. It's, um... Lungs or something are important. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know a lot about it, but uh, but I feel that way with quite a few drugs. I think you can't just do them forever. Like to me, LSD. There is a point in your life where you go, I have had my last LSD trip, and uh, my last one was about four years ago, and uh, it was on New Year's Eve. We went to this wonderful place in the country. A friend of ours had this great property, and uh, just this little sort of shacky house, this beautiful property around it, and. Uh, there's about 30 people there. Everyone was really cool. Everyone's getting on really well. No one's sort of going, you touch me, stubby, Barry. You know, very calm. But at one stage, three of us, myself and these two other guys, went on this little walk. And we were taking really little steps. We were, taking this, we were going this walk down to a pier. And we were taking really little steps, right? Because we realised that if we took normal-sized steps, something bad would happen in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> so, we take little steps, we get down to the pier, and there's this little boat there, right? And we just went, whoa! Yeah, boat up! Boat on! Woo! Yeah! Grab your teeth! <laughs> no one knows why. <laughs> So we jammed into this boat, right? We jammed in this little boat. It's like me, another guy there, and another guy there. We're just in the boat going, we are so in the boat. <laughs> boat on, boat up. And like, we're in the boat, grabbing our teeth, and, uh, and we, you know, I'm watching the rope. I'm watching the rope that's tying the boat up to the pier. And after about a minute, the rope just goes bloink into the water. And the boat very quickly drifts out to the middle of this lake, right? And we were just out of our tree houses on chemicals, right? Like, we weren't freaking out, we were just going, oh, oh don't walk on the blue stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's my advice there. And after about 45 minutes, the boat drifted back to literally where it had been. Like, within two or three feet of where it had started from. And the guy in the middle gets up in the boat and he's going, I'll put my foot out. We're going, don't put your foot out. He goes, no, I'll put my foot out. And he just goes, ah, like that. And grabs the pier with his other foot, right? And then very calmly pulls the boat up to the pier. So we scrambled onto the pier. Once we were on the pier, we started acting really tough and nautical, you know, and going, hurry me, hurry Looking for doubloons and like getting half maps tattooed on our chest. <laughs> we went back up to the party and, uh, and you know, forgot all about it and went to bed. Now, the next morning we got up and freaked out a bit because we realised the property that we were on was about 600 miles inland and there was absolutely no water anywhere. <laughs> None, right? Like we got up just going, oh my God, somebody's stolen the lake. <laughs> we were the last ones to use it. <laughs> oh, grab your teeth. <laughs> Too much weirdness. It's, um, so weird things will happen when you're on drugs, quite obviously. And, uh, and probably the weirdest things and the most stressful things will happen on this, the next drug I'm going to talk about, which is heroin. And uh, the way that I got involved with using heroin was I was doing a play at a youth arts centre. And we all know how good those plays can be. <laughs> no wonder people get drug habits. Uh, but, um, I was doing a play there and I met this girl and I fell madly in love. I fell insanely in love. I was about 19 years old. She was maybe six months older than me. And... I adored her. And I used to, like, I, I, I'd carry her books home from rehearsal. I'd carry her bags home from rehearsal, you know. And that actually gave her the shits because she didn't know where I lived. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'd been snorting a bit of speed at this stage, right? I was snorting a bit of speed. And I thought that was pretty heavy, right? That was about as heavy as, you know, as I was going to get. And uh, one day she said to me, oh, um, I hear you, just, you know, you take a bit of speed. And I went, oh, yeah. Yeah, because she said, we, we'll take it. And I went, oh, yeah, well, then, yeah, I do. Oh, yeah, yeah, I take speed. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And she said, uh, do you inject it? And I went, what? <laughs> she said, do you inject speed? We, we all inject it. And I went, oh, inject speed. Oh, you said inject, oh, yes. Yeah, of course, I inject speed. 
speed. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't call me Mr. Speedy Needle for nothing, you know. <laughs> and uh, that was basically, you know, the start of our relationship. Like, obviously, I didn't inject speed. But we started hanging out together a fair bit. And one day, I woke up, and she was climbing in my bedroom window. Now, if you're in love with someone, and you wake up and they're climbing in your bedroom window, there are worse things in the world. Than that, you know? <laughs> there are. And... Um, and her brother's there, right? Her brother was also climbing in the bedroom window and uh, that would be one of the things there. <laughs> that's worse. Uh, they came in and said, look, do you want to go score? And I said, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking they're talking about pot, right? So I said, yeah, let's go score. So we went out to score. Now, halfway through this trip, I realised that they were talking about heroin. And I did what most people would do, which is kind of go, oh, hang on, wait. And they said, what? And I said, I didn't realise you were talking about heroin. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you knew. And I said, no, I, I didn't know. And they said, well, you, you know, you don't have to do it. They said, don't, you know, don't do it. And I said, well, I'm not saying I don't want to do it. I'm just saying I didn't know that that's what was going on. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know. So they're saying, look, don't, don't do it, you know, don't do it unless you're sure. Maybe think about it, you know, then do it. And, and they, but they were doing it, and I liked them. They seemed like normal people. And I said, well, I don't know. I said, what's it like? And they said to me, it's better than sex. And I said, well, if you mean the kind of sex I've been having recently, that's no great recommendation. <laughs> and they said, no, even good sex. And I thought, fuck, I've heard of that. Uh, that's meant to be quite pleasurable, right? So we talked about it for a while, and finally I just thought, yes. I thought, yes, I want to do this thing. You know, I want to know what this is like. I'd heard a lot about it, and I thought, I want to try it. I want to know what it feels like. So we went off to get heroin, right? And we went to St Kilda. And now I'm sure most of you know that St Kilda is like, you know, King's Cross, whatever, right? So I'd never been to St Kilda before. We're driving into St Kilda. I'm in the back of the car going, oh, my God, I'm going to St Kilda. I'm going to become a prostitute. <laughs> I, I was overreacting a little bit. <laughs> We get there, we go to this coffee shop to buy the heroin, right? And uh, that surprised me anyway, because I thought we'd be going to, like, Jimmy's Heroin Supplies or something. <laughs> so we go to this coffee shop, and uh, they bring out coffee. We order coffee, they bring out coffee, and it's, like, saucers like that, coffee cup there, and a teaspoon. Now, the teaspoon had hole drilled through it. All the teaspoons had holes drilled through them, so the junkies wouldn't take the teaspoons and keep them to, like, mix their heroin up in, right? Now, knowing what I do about junkies now, most of the ones I knew would have still kept the teaspoon anyway, right? <laughs> just got, got home with it and just gone up. I don't get it, Barry, it's all disappearing. We've been ripped off, we've been ripped off. Put more in, put more in. You know? There'd be this huge pyramid of heroin under the spoon. There'd be Egyptian kings living in there, you know, with scarab beetles all over it. So we, uh, we finally got the heroin from this bizarre coffee shop, all these weird people really out of it, people, older people on drugs, which I'd never considered, right? I'd never even thought about that. We finally got the heroin, went back to someone's house to have it. And um, they'd got out all the equipment. They were very dexterous at doing this, right? Very, very good with them. Um, it amazed me how quickly they put all this together. Like spoons and water and medical swabs cleaning down the spoon and all this stuff, put the heroin in the spoon. Then they brought out the needles. And when I saw the needles, I kind of went, wallpaper's pretty interesting. <laughs> well, well, look at that. Blue on blue. How do they do that? <laughs> and finally they said, look, it's your turn. They said, yours is ready. Um, do you want to do it yourself? And I said, no. I said, no. I, I won't do it myself because I'm not a doctor! So I was a little bit edgy. And, uh, so I got them to do it for me, right? Because um, obviously they were all trained medical practitioners. And, um, so I'm doing that. And two things. One, it didn't hurt. And the other thing was, it did not feel that amazing. It did not feel that remarkable. But what was remarkable about that night was that was the first night that I ended up sleeping with this woman who I was so in love with. So that's, and yet again to me, romance and substance abuse sort of came into play again, right? So we started hanging out with each other all the time. We basically moved in with each other. We started using drugs all the time. We started injecting heroin, injecting speed, and it was fantastic fun. That's one thing that gets overlooked all the time in drug education and stuff like that. It was brilliant fun. And kids wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun, right? So we loved it. It was exciting. It was dirty. It was wrong. It was all the things you wanted out of life, right? And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was really good fun. And we felt excited. We felt, you know, naught. And, and eventually it became incredibly depressing. It became dangerous. It became deadly. It became repulsive. But initially it was great. And uh, we became part of a subculture, not unlike any other subculture, not unlike an ethnic minority, not unlike a, a gay subculture, whatever. The main difference being that those groups of people will do things to better their position in society, generally. Do things to raise society's awareness of what they're about, what they can offer society, what society can offer them, etc. Junkies are never going to do that. 
Junkies never get that politically motivated. You know, I can't imagine Junkies all going, right, OK, Phil, I'll be the Prime Minister, right? Yeah, good idea, Steve. Can I, like, can I be the Treasurer or all that? No way, you'll steal all the money. Yeah, good point. So I, don't, I don't really see it happening, you know? And, uh, and what's the platform going to be anyway? So, like, what do we want? Heroin. When do we want it? Well, now would be good. <laughs> Maybe some for a bit later on, you know? The one thing I did get into doing, though, was pawning stuff, hocking stuff. Pawn shops, hock shops all the time. Like, I would work, I'd acquire possessions, I'd acquire a life, I'd have, you know, stereo, I'd have a TV, video recorder, car, all that stuff. And then I would just not be working and I would just hock everything that I owned for ludicrous prices. And, like, people who own pawn shops and hock shops see you coming. And if you're a junkie, I don't know if they love it, but they know they're going to make a killing. And they see you coming. And, like, I remember one carrying a $1,000 stereo, my stereo, carrying it for, like... Like an hour walking and walking and walking, so I couldn't even afford a tram fare. I finally get to this place, put this thousand dollar stereo down on the, the bench, and the guy went, I'll give you 60 bucks. And I went, What? That's worth a thousand dollars? And he went, Oh, well, I mean, you know, I can give you 60. He said, You could carry it somewhere else you like, and unless you feel too sick. Because they are honourable people, aren't they? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not saying junkies should be treated with any respect, but. You know, it's good to see people out there preying on the low life of society, you know. And, uh, yeah, but it, it is good. I mean, I'm being a little hard on pawn shop owners, really, because it is good to know that there's someone who'll give you 15 bucks for your wedding ring. I think that's great. <laughs> no, I really do. I think that's lovely. You know, and, and I think you know your drug habit is getting out of control when you go into the pawn shop and it looks exactly like your living room used to. <laughs> There's even, like, a couple of your friends on hooks there going, Flea, do you said it'd only be a couple of weeks, you know? Like, <laughs> but, um, now... I talked about the fun, right? I talked about how fun it was getting into this world and how exciting and dynamic and stuff it was. But it also is very bleak. Obviously, you know, it becomes a nightmare. And uh, people die. That's the other thing, the quite obvious thing, is people die. And, uh, and the weird thing is about this, you actually get accustomed to it when people die. And you would think that if you were doing something and it started killing people that you knew, like your lover or your sister or your brother or whatever, that you would just go, that's it, I am never doing it again. But most people I know who've used heroin or still do, when someone dies, one of the first things they will do is go and get more heroin and use it. And it's because it's a painkiller. And it, it's a way of blocking out the emotional pain of what is going on, the reality of that situation. And so people will do it. And, uh, for example, the person that I got into doing it with, the person that I loved so much, who, uh, who I talked about earlier, but one day we went out and scored. And, uh, you know, we were still very much in love and we still, you know, it was still an adventure to be with each other. We went out and scored one day with another friend of ours and um, we scored from someone we don't usually score from. We went back home and uh, we each had a little $50 deal of heroin and we split up in the house to have it, you know, because it's a very sharing drug. And, uh, <laughs> and before she went off to have hers, I said to her, hey, be really careful. I said, be really careful. Like, the last time you had it, you, you had too much, so why not have half? Have half if you want to have the other half later. Have the other half later. Like, it's, it's a lot better to have two holes in your arm than to be dead, right? Because I was a bit of a junkie philosopher. <laughs> and uh, so she said, OK, and she went off to have hers in the bedroom. Now, I sat down in the living room and started mixing mine up. She was a lot quicker at it than I was. And before I'd even had mine, she came out of the bedroom just going like this. And I, I caught her eyes and I went, you had it all, didn't you? And she went, yeah. But it's okay. I'm doing star jumps. <laughs> I just went, what? She said, oh, I'm doing star jumps. It keeps your blood circulating. And then she just pivoted and just for a second looked more beautiful than I'd ever seen her look and then just head dived into my fireplace. And I lost my mind. I, didn't, I had no idea what to do. I dragged her out of the fireplace and she was just dead. Right? She was like, not breathing, no pulse, uh, making a noise that no human being should make in their throat. Like, I had never heard a sound like this, and I pray to God I never hear it again. And she was turning a different colour. Like, within 30 seconds, was turning a different colour. I didn't even know people did that as they were dying, right? And I did not know what to do. I'm thinking, mouth to mouth, give her mouth to mouth. I knew jack shit about mouth to mouth. And I'm literally, like, sort of just prodding this person and hoping that somehow that would bring them back to life, right? I said to the other guy who'd already had his, I said, just keep her breathing, right? Just fucking keep her breathing. I went running out in the street and I said, I need a doctor. Is there a doctor here, please? And this guy came up to me and went, I'm an accountant. 
I thought, this isn't meant to happen unless you're tripping, right? So I went back in the house, I rang an ambulance, I put down the phone, and the guy that I had left with her, like her other best friend in the whole world, had just nodded off on her face, right? It was just like asleep on her face. I picked him up by the hair, got rid of him, and just vaguely somehow tried to keep it like I was like shaking her and stuff. And like it's you're watching the person you're in love with die, right? And you're thinking that the panic and the terror that is going through your mind and the like the things you think I would do anything. I would do anything. And you're also thinking, why didn't anybody warn me about this? And like everybody had warned you about it all the time. But until it's actually happening, you just don't get it, right? And finally these ambulance guys came and they had her on the ground and like we we're all standing back going, thank God they're here. They they sat down with her for like a couple of minutes and then they just stood up and they turned around to me and this guy just went, sorry, mate. And I just said, what do you mean? Sorry, I said, just do something, right? For God's sake, do something. And they picked her up and they put her on the couch and they gave her a shot of this stuff called Narcaine, which is meant to just wake you up like that if you've had a heroin overdose. And they gave her a shot of this stuff and like, nothing, right? So they gave her another shot of, of this Narcaine and she went, Oh my God, I feel really straight. That dope was a fucking rip-off, right? <laughs> and I just went, what? A rip-off? I said, you've been dead. You've been dead for like 10 minutes, right? And she grabbed me like this and she said, have you had yours yet? And I went, no way. And she went, thank God. Can I have half? Oh, and no. I just thought, this is getting well out of control, right? <laughs> and, uh, and it was, and it was like, not long after that, we split up and, uh, and a couple of weeks later she stopped using all drugs and she just never did it again. It amazed me the way she did it. She just went, that's it. And that was around the time that I decided to stop too, right? I thought, you know, that was too intense. That really freaked me out and I thought, okay, that's it for me too. And not long after that I went to the rehabilitation place and then went home and, you know, had the, the phone call from the truth and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, we'll go back to, to the beginning of the show. So I'm standing at the front of this news agent. I'm looking at this picture of my head saying, Neighbours Star tells my heroin ordeal. And for the first time in 12 years of being a heroin addict, I just went, I cannot believe that this is what I've done with my life. This is how shit my life has become. I mean... I can't believe it. I have actually been on Neighbours. <laughs> and that was it for me. I thought, I'm quitting before I do Home and Away. But look, you guys have been sensational. Thank you very much and take care. Peace. will return to the smallest room in the house next Monday. This week, Paul McDermott is joined by the poetic Margaret Scott, the audacious Amanda Keller, and the indescribable Anthony Morgan. It's going to be a great Good News Week, 8 o'clock Friday night. Coming up, Express. <laughs>